The world is undergoing huge economic upheavals. Once powerful nations are being humbled. This is actually good for China. Now that the tools of Western power are in the spotlight, the International Monetary Fund is on the front line, under attack. We don't want the IMF in here. The IMF created the situation. We are uh, rejecting this intervention of the IMF. The IMF had got things wrong all the way down the line. Its defenders say, you better off with us here than with us home. But people are starting to ask, do we still need the IMF? This is him. Hello and welcome to Empire. The International Monetary Fund is no stranger to criticism. In recent months, it's been in the international headlines for all the wrong reasons. But as well as enduring embarrassing personal scandals, the fund has much bigger problems. From across the political spectrum, it's faced accusations of exploitations and favoritism almost since the day it was founded. But in the last three years, the global economy has undergone a seismic shift and the financial world is still reeling. The old divides between North and South have become blurred. Emerging economies and new democracies in the Arab world and elsewhere are taking a look at what the IMF has to offer and are increasingly saying, thanks, but no thanks. Is the IMF up for a change? Can it reform itself? Or is it still beholden to Western geoeconomics? Joining me to discuss these issues are economist Dr. George Korm, former Lebanese Minister of Finance. He's advised the World Bank, UNDP, and the European Commission, among others, the author of The New Global Government. Dr. Anne Pettifor, the Executive Director of Advocacy International and Prime Policy Research in Macroeconomics. She's the author of The Real World Economic Outlook and The Coming First World Debt Crisis. Dr. Mario Blecher, former governor of Argentina's Central Bank, former director of the Center of the Central Banking Studies at the Bank of England. He's held various senior positions at the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. And last, but by no means least, Professor Alex Kalinikos, director of the Center of European Studies at King's College London, is the author of Bonfire of Illusions on the Economic Crisis, among many other titles. Our starting point is Europe. If the IMF is riding to the rescue of the Greek economy, why are these people so angry? For more than a year now, scenes of widespread Greek protests have grown commonplace. But out on the streets, the focus of their fury has increasingly been aimed at institutions like the IMF. Wherever the IMF gives aid, the measures it imposes lead to deep recessions and great unemployment. Already the problems here are great. They will become greater. The anger towards the fund isn't restricted to Greece. It's taking place right across Europe in nations at the economic periphery. For each euro that they are lending us, they are taking two. And so we are rejecting this plan of austerity, of austerity and we are uh, rejecting this intervention of the IMF. We don't want the IMF in here. The IMF created the situation. And they're in for money. And they don't care about the future. They don't care about Ireland. The problem lies in the fact that the plan put forward to remedy the Eurozone crisis is designed to protect banks and major financial institutions first and foremost, not the taxpayers. And this plan is partially funded and wholly endorsed by the IMF. And what makes it worse is that these economic interventions are often justified in profoundly arrogant ways. I understand that there may be demonstration against the IMF, people saying, uh, a very well-known IMF go home. I won't say I'm happy with that. But really, you're better off with us here than with us home. But who is better off? When we compare this intervention, this Eurozone remedy is remarkably similar to the bailout program now underway in the United States. Yet again, the banks are being saved with taxpayers' money, even though those banks are the very institutions responsible for the crisis in the first place. This way of thinking lies at the heart of the IMF criticism and has 
since it was founded. At the end of the Second World War, the IMF and the World Bank were set up to prevent the economic conditions which precipitated the war ever happening again. And at the time, there was no question the only model to follow was Western liberal economics. But the past few years have demonstrated to the world the shortcomings of this system. So given its role, shouldn't the IMF be the institution at the forefront of change? That became clear when the IMF faced a crisis a few months ago when the director was forced to resign after becoming embroiled in a sex scandal. Many saw this as the perfect opportunity for the fund to promote a new leader from the emerging world. But the West looked at the candidates and chose one of their own. In principle, we know that in the medium term, emerging countries could have a claim for top IMF jobs. However, with the current situation in Europe, there are strong reasons for Europe to have good people ready. And because of that decision, the entire strategy towards the Greek bailout and the wider Eurozone crisis suddenly starts to make sense. History suggests that if this were happening to a poor country, the rich countries would have voted against it. The Western powers simply have too much invested in their grand Euro project to let it fail. It is uh, much more than just a coin. It is, uh, from my uh, point of view, it is a political project. And maintaining that project requires the West to use the mechanisms at its disposal to maintain the system at all costs. When European leaders say that we will do everything what is required to save the Eurozone, it is very simple. We mean it. Voices from within the IMF itself insist the bailout isn't really about Greece at all. It's about saving European banks exposed to Greek debt to salvage the entire Euro experiment itself. Greece is not having an easy time. The mostly European private creditors of Greece have had an easy time. This then explains why these people are so angry. Those inside the club take care of their own. Those outside the club have to pay for it all. And why don't you start us off? How do you think the IMF handled the Greek crisis and Europe in general? The, the IMF continues, I think, as your report rightly suggests, to act, as you, if you like, as a uh, carbuncle on this great giant vampire, which is creditor interests around the world, i.e. the financial interests that have captured, in a sense, um, uh, European assets, um, that have lent money to governments recklessly and now expect taxpayers to bail them out. But what they then did was to insist, together with their allies in academia and the media, on imposing austerity. And what austerity does to Greece and to the rest of Europe and to the United States is to squeeze the public finances, to make it harder to bail out the banks. And yet they continue to demand that. So there's a deep, deep contradiction at the heart of the IMF strategy on behalf of its friends in the banks. You, you've worked with the IMF. Uh, uh, Mario, why the contradiction? The first reaction of the fund uh, to the financial crisis of 2007 8 uh, was quite correct, in my view, was an expansionary uh, policy. It, it really promoted fiscal expansion at the beginning of the crisis, and that helped during that period. Then it turned around, and uh, this program actually in, uh, in Greece, in Portugal, in Ireland, particularly the Greek program, was very badly designed, very badly designed. Even for the fund, it was badly designed, in the sense that it was based on, on a wrong assumption. The assumption was that Greece will be able to come back to the, to the voluntary market, to the credit market in 2012, next year. This is impossible. So the program was not financed. In addition to that, even if you really, really stick to the austerity that I've been mentioned, all these three countries, Greece, Portugal, and Ireland, will see, even if you stick to all the conditions and you do, you fulfill everything that has been required from the IMF, in 2015, the debt over GDP will be higher than today. So obviously that's unsustainable. It's not a rescue of the countries concerned, it's a rescue of their creditors. And that in combination with the austerity uh, policies that have been part of the price of the so-called rescues makes them extremely dubious from not simply an economic but also a moral perspective. Yeah. But the IMF isn't acting on its own in Europe. 
It's acting as part of the Troika, so-called, of the European Commission and the European Central Bank. And if you mm. listen to Greek political discourse, for example, the people's eye is directed against the Troika. Personally, I think that the IMF is becoming of increasingly marginal importance. In the Eurozone, what the IMF is dealing with is not just the protection of creditors and bankers, but the protection of the Euro, which is a deeply flawed monetary framework. But it is the framework. It's not just a program. It's the framework that the IMF promoted everywhere, including in Argentina, when they, they encouraged the dollarization of those economies. Just so as just as Argentina had to borrow at a rate of interest set by Mr. Alan Greenspan in New York and with a, at a currency level set that suits the Americans, so the Greeks have had to deal with a, with a currency that suits the Germans, maybe, and the French and the North Europeans, but it doesn't suit the poor countries of Europe. I don't think that the IMF changed at the beginning of the crisis. When Mr. Strauss-Kahn just said, yes, we shouldn't go to austerity measures too soon, Europe and the US uh, should maintain uh, liquidity in the mm. system, etc. But if you look at what happened on the ground, because we didn't mention that the IMF was called for Hungary mm. and then yes. for uh, Romania yes. and, and for other kinds, Latvia and Lettonia, yes. the same kind of mess. And today, what do you have in Hungary? Mm. The extreme right mm. uh, is going up with all the misery that yeah. has come with the IMF program. Yeah. And I wouldn't say that it's being marginalized. It was marginalized before the crisis, totally. Out yes. of business. Out yeah. of business. Because Out of, of business. Before 2008, you mean? Uh, most governments were fed up. I remember as a minister, I always say, keep away from me. I never go through a standby agreement with you, in spite of the but fact that Lebanon was heavily indebted. You know, if you look at the numbers, today, today the programs for Greece, uh, Ireland, and Portugal are 66% of the total amount of commitment of the fund. Two thirds are going to only to these to three, three countries. And if you had all of Europe, including Eastern Europe, is 83%. 83% yeah. of the total uh, commitments of the fund have gone to Europe. So I think that this is not an international monetary fund, yeah, it's an yeah. European but monetary fund. I completely agree with that. Let's, let's discuss why, why that its role has changed. And I think that the decisive event was East Asia, and in particular the role that the IMF played Absolutely. in the so-called rescues of countries like South Korea and Indonesia. Why, why do you say so-called, but didn't actually help with $60 billion South well, Korea? Well, in South Korea, they still refer to the crisis of the late 1990s as the IMF crisis because they see the IMF as essentially the collection agency Absolutely. for the Western corporations. There's a photograph that was taken, I think, in early 1998 of Kam Desu, who was then the managing director of the IMF, standing over the Indonesian yes. president, Suharto, yes. as he signed the articles of agreement with the Shocking. IMF. And I, th I thought at the time, this is an incredibly stupid thing to do because it's an arrogant declaration of Western supremacy mm. over, over Asia. And that was stupid because <laughs> so much economic power was shifting to Asia. So every Asian politician looked at that photograph and thought, I'm going to make sure I'm, I'm never in a position where uh, that, c that can that happen kind of paternalism. to me. And I think that's the moment at which the IMF, the IMF's power depended upon it being a supplier of scarce capital to countries that were in trouble, who were usually on the, the periphery of the world, world economy. But now a section of the periphery has risen and has said it's not going to be subject to that kind of power. George, your answer yeah. for an answer. No, no, I was saying that, uh, in fact, the, the IMF, who was totally marginalized for the crisis, came back into the spotlight because at the first G8 summit uh, in 2008, the leaders of the big Western countries of the G8 say, we have no idea, we don't understand what happened, let us ask the IMF to study the situation. And this is how IMF came back to the limelight. October 2007, they issued a World Economic Yes. overview which they said, no that idea. The, said that the, the world economy was becoming well, more stable yes, and less absolutely. No, no, and the drama here is that whenever a year later they allow the, the BRICS, the big emerging economies, to raise their share in the equity capital of the IMF, they say we have reformed the IMF. 
why the entire staff structure, the way of yeah, thinking of the IMF, especially when it comes to those standby programs yeah. and imposing conditions on, on, on countries yeah, with difficulty, uh, is but the that's same. The, that's the danger of intellectual capture, you see. I think that, that, that the G8, the ECB, the EU, and the IMF all are you know, engaged in groupthink, and they can't think outside that box. The, the big problem is the way that these programs are designed and implemented, and they do not solve the problems. And today, it, uh, it is the, the whole institution has been captured, basically, by the European problem. The fund has 28 programs at this moment, 28 programs uh, which are called poverty reduction and, ah. and, and growth, yeah. okay? Now, all no these 28 way. programs are all the, dis the, 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 the commitments on these 28 programs are 10% of the Greek program. All the 28 is 10% of so the Greek program. But, 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 but their effect on these countries is huge. Yes, but these countries... They develop under development in those but countries. But I think, I I think I we need to get away think. from the IMF mm. here because actually what we're talking about is pr the profession, if I may say so, to my distinguished mm. colleagues here, of economics. Oh, I know what economist, we've, thank what God. we've done, <laughs> what we have here is an economic orthodoxy, which the IMF is simply the yeah. s uh, spokesperson for. Spokes I, 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 I agree and with they just Politburo. mouth this incredibly G8, flawed economic. So I want to blame the academics who are responsible for these crazy policies, which are so impoverishing people, and now wrecking both the eurozone, damaging the U.S. And you know, causing a global social as well as economic and political well, crisis. Jo uh, jo jo George, you have a whole chapter in your book about grooming uh, an entire new generation yeah, the intellectual of economists. Capture, uh, yes, I mean the millions of MBAs or ah. of economics based on uh, mathematical modeling, mm. which is out of touch with reality, sure. has been produced in the world is an army of uh, just people uh, with one eye or half an eye, it's terrible. Sure, sure. I don't want to dismiss the complicity of the, the academics, but the IMF exists and has played the kind of role that it has, particularly and has taxpayer in, resources. in the neoliberal era because it's proved useful to the dominant powers in the world. Since economic power is shifting eastwards, will the new spectrum of dominant powers find the IMF as useful an institution no. as the West has. No. Why are the likes of China and Brazil getting in on the business of the IMF? Why are they so interested to be part of it? Well, they're interested to be part of it because they would like to have a, a voice in, in the international arena. So it's not so useless then, the IMF? No, I, I, we have been discussing so far all the issue of the programs and the, and the financial role of the IMF, but the IMF has other roles. And in some of the roles have been useful, the, the inter in interchange of information. You, you get uh, quite a lot of uh, good statistics and quite a go lot of good analysis that is not being put in practice, if you want. But, yeah, but, 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 but Dr. Blacher, I mean, they did get it wrong on so many times and been surprised yes, they have in got each and every crisis. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. No, no, they did. They did. Prime, they did, they Mexico, 95, uh, absolutely. You know, Southeast Asia, 90. Uh, they kept issuing reports the whole saying profession all got well. the, the, There was a discussion here right now. The whole profession got it wrong. But I think it goes further. I think that all of these institutions and academia have been captured by a very small financial elite. Yes. That's captured, it's, and it is a vampire squid. I wish you'd stop pointing squid. at me whenever <laughs> you refer to <laughs> academia, <laughs> since I've been resisting these ideas. You had, ideas different, you had a different question. I beg your I, you had a different question I want to go give back about the, the role of uh, China and Brazil and India and, and all the emerging markets. Uh, you mentioned that there was some reform and increased their share. No, but it isn't a reform in my the, view. Yes, yes. Well, well, okay. But this was, was sold yeah. as being the reform of the IMF. Yeah, but I, what, what, what you have to, to see is that that did not happen really. Yeah. And one of the reforms that was supposed to take place is that the next managing director does not have to come directly from Europe. Mm -hmm. And that didn't take place. So yeah. it means that from the governance point of view, the IMF has a big problem. Yeah. I think it was useful for them to make a big fuss about another European being appointed, but yeah. to, let it, to let it go ahead. And that, I think, partly is because I think the, the battle over the directorships of the IMF and all that kind of thing are a symbolic struggle. It's yeah. important yeah. for China and Brazil etc. Yeah, to be more recognized in global forums doesn't mean that the IMF itself is that. When I was at the IMF I worked very much in China, a lot in China, very, I used to go every month and it was extremely important for them to have a voice in there. They considered to have a voice in the IMF a very important world recognition of their status.
No, but there was this uh, initiative by Japan in the crisis in yeah. 97 yes. to create an IMF mm. for a facility for Asia. For Asia. And right. then the American government went yeah. out yeah. of his mind. Yeah. 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 Yes. It's like forbidden. It would be much harder for them to do that now. No, but yeah. the Asians don't need it. They now. don't need it now. <laughs> It's one of the great ironies of history. It seems that uh, most of the problems are coming from those sort of new, so-called neoliberal economic policies. And yet the IMF is the arm of established neoliberalism around the world. How do you expect that the IMF give the prescription for the sort of problems that its own ideology no, creates? No, no, I, I, I already made it clear that I don't believe that the IMF design of programs <laughs> is going to, to be the solution to the problem. But I'm just saying that there are some problems in the world that come from different issues. If you look at uh, economic growth or economic activity in Africa, 1945 to 1980, it's fairly healthy. You look at it after 80, mm. when the IMF yeah. arrives, it, uh, Africa goes backwards. And there's a direct correlation between this period, which is essentially a period of Keynesian policies, and the neoliberals' policies post-1980. This is a very important point, but we're going to have to address it when we come back from the break. But before we take a news break, we're going to need to take a look at what happened in Argentina some time ago to look to see if the IMF has ever learned its lessons. It all looked so good in the 90s. Argentina was the IMF's star pupil and did everything they asked. Free market reforms, privatizations, it even pegged its currency to the dollar. But the economy went into recession. The people are hungry. My husband is unemployed and I can't feed my children. This can't go on. We have to obey the IMF. So Argentina went back to the IMF doctor, who upped the austerity dose. It slashed public spending, it raised taxes and interest rates, and of course took plenty of IMF loans. The key for Argentina is to get her fiscal house in order, get monetary policy in order. It'll all be done through the IMF. Yet the cure ended up being worse than the disease. And the combination of cuts and taxes almost killed the patient. Prescribing these fiscal spending cuts and cuts to the salaries of state workers and of the retired means that the economy is going to contract because there's going to be less spending in the economy. And so if the economy contracts, then fiscal revenues are also going to continue to contract. And so you're in a downward spiral. It was a vicious circle. The government needed $22 billion a year just to service its debt. So the IMF loans were only prolonging the agony. In the next two or three days, we're going to work intensively with the IMF. What followed was enormous capital flight and a run on deposits. And with its currency pegged to the dollar, Argentina had no room for maneuver, and it became insolvent. I think following the IMF prescriptions has been part of the problem. At $132 billion, it was the biggest default in history. You'd think this would be a salutary lesson. So why is the IMF prescribing the same to Greece? Welcome back. The Arab world and Africa have had their own share of political and economic turbulence over the last few months and years, and the IMF wasn't far from the epicenter of the storm. Critics of the IMF are plentiful. But are their arguments a bit too simplistic? After all, the IMF is not about restoring economic prosperity. It's about avoiding economic calamity. Two very different things. But here's the catch. What happens when a country's leadership isn't interested in achieving prosperity for its people? When it comes to dictatorships, is the IMF a reformer or an enabler? In the days before the Libyan revolution began, Tripoli appeared calm. For Western institutions like the IMF, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. In fact, a mere 48 hours before people began risking their lives in protest, the fund issued a report. The outlook for Libya's economy, it said, remains favorable. In Egypt, the work of the revolution has at last exposed to the world what the IMF has long known, that the Mubarak dynasty has ruthlessly exploited its own citizens for decades. And yet, just last year, the IMF was praising the Egyptian government for its careful fiscal management. In Tunisia, the disgraced former leader 
Sene al Abedin Ben Ali has already been found guilty in absentia of embezzling more than $25 million. And yet somehow, just months before he fled, the IMF credited the Ben Ali regime with sound macroeconomic management. This praise was little comfort to a young Tunisian man desperate enough to set himself on fire, or the millions of his fellow countrymen forced to live in economic destitution. Already, the transitional Egyptian government has rejected a new IMF loan, preferring instead to institute reforms itself. That's forced the new director of the fund to defend its work. The IMF never forces programs down the throat of anybody. The IMF only uh, offers services if it is asked. And she says she understands why Egypt is choosing to go it alone for now. If the country determines that it can actually organize its economic uh, situation, this is great. But if it can't, and if it needs outside support and, uh, and, and, and funding, then it should really think of the fund as uh, an institution that is available. It could be argued that the IMF simply misread the Arab Spring, badly underestimating the will of the people. But this logic falls apart when different examples are brought to bear and a pattern starts to emerge. These countries all suffered under dictatorships and all of them were given massive IMF loans. After the Duvaliers fled, Haiti realized 80% of its total debt was owed to the IMF. The same story in South Africa at the end of apartheid. Malawi, more than 80%. Somalia, more than 90 Paraguay, Congo, Sudan, Indonesia. The legacy of corrupt leadership matched by the legacy of crippling IMF debt. These statistics may come as a shock to many in the West, but they might also help explain why the Arab revolutionaries had no choice but to take matters into their own hands. And this also helps to explain why the IMF is beginning to accept the growing global criticism. What I see as a significant change in the last few years has been the ability of the fund under the leadership of its uh, managing director to um, make the approach more comprehensive uh, to address the employment slash unemployment issues, the social fabrics of society, as opposed to looking exclusively and in a sort of uh, sanitized way at numbers. This question of addressing the social fabric of society lies at the heart of the IMF criticism. The challenge for the fund and its new leader is whether the IMF is at last ready to listen to what emerging economies have been saying for years. George, you've, owned, you've known uh, Madame Lagarde yes. from before. What, what's wrong with what she just said? The IMF in the last 10 years, almost 15 years, have been absent from the Arab world. Almost all Arab countries, maybe for the exception of Yemen or Mauritania, was having a standby with the IMF. Absolutely. Now, the fact that we're talking they about evaluation. evaluated. I, I because that's what Mario said before, but one of know, its main I jobs again, is evaluations. Again, again, being minister, I was asking the IMF to downturn his uh, appraisal so positive of the banking system in Lebanon. I said, I, I cannot make any reforms of the banks and I need to reform you them. You keep saying they're but, great. But uh, you so keep why? saying why they're do so they do great. That? Why do they do that? Ah, it's the financial Organized. elites. Yeah. Our five, six big banks who really control the economy of the country mm. are, of course, very close to the IMF, to mm. the World mm. Bank, to the G8 leaders, to this and to that. It's That's the financial corruption. club. That's I, got the I, didn't Mario. Yeah, I don't corruption. think this is the case. First of all, this miss, missing, missing the situation, missing the crisis is not only in the Arab countries. I mean, if you look at, just look at the report on Iceland two weeks before yeah, the crisis. Yeah. They it's don't have a, contact with the real economy. It's, 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 it's incredible they positive. Yes. Now, why this happened? I don't think this is uh, sort of a conspiracy. This I, I think because the, the fund is a political organization it's, it, and there is, Always, always the, the need, as regarded by the board of the fund, as regarded by the staff of the fund, to please the government in, in charge. 
I see. So there's a complicity between the leadership of the IMF with the governments. The leadership and the staff too, uh, because you actually work in these countries and you always want to please the, the governments of these uh, of these countries. You will find very rare cases where there is criticism. Well, and it can the, be very harsh, especially if you're not, you have a, a minister with yes. a finance which yes. is now politically correct yes. or That's economically correct. correct. Oh. That's correct if the country has no, the, that is correct if the country has no uh, power in the fund. Actually, yes, Alex, we remember in 1991 yeah. when Yemen did not vote with the U.S. in the Security Council. At the time, the U.S. ambassador uh, told the Yemenis, this is going to be a very costly vote for not voting for the war in Iraq. Yes. And they did not get their IMF money. But they, yeah. that's a very long-standing pattern. In, yeah. the, in the early 90s, big? the Financial Times published an internal IMF report which showed that they knew that the money the fund was lending to Mobutu, the dictator of Zaire, was being misappropriated for the benefit of his of, of his family, and the reason for that was because he was on the right side in the in the in the Cold War. Is that why they keep lending? Well, I mean, the situation. Is, the, yeah. the, yes, I mean, we're, it's very clear from what what Mario said. This is a, who? To the to friendly interest. and friendly to the banks, friendly Look, to Western uh, banks in particular. You will never mm. find in a report of the IMF the word uh, thi this is a uh, non democratic country or this is no, no, uh, corruption. The word corruption doesn't appear in the reports of the IMF. This type of thing does not appear. No. Never. In the, uh, the so world is the cost? Transaction yes, cost. Yes, yes. Is, is transaction cost. Is, is the, word, yes. the reports of the fund are usually sanitized, but it's true what has been said, what you said, that it could be harsh. But it's harsh if there is a political interest within the fund. Sure, to, sure. To if the West wants to whack it's not someone, the West, then could, there's, uh, there's a bit of contradiction what I'm hearing so far. So if IMF is bad for your economy and you're in the third world, and then they decide to punish you but not giving you money, but that's, that's good for you in the end. Well, it's, it's, not, it's not, it's not good not to have the money. The problem is that the money c comes with very harsh conditions. That's, but if that's you, the problem. But if you think of the IMF Act as the gatekeeper for the world's capital markets, that means mm. if I'm a landlocked country and I need to get dollars to pay for oil, I have to rely on the IMF. So, you, you know, you can never is, win because th it's not just right. their money that they stop coming. It's, it's aid money, it's private money. Any kind of money is now blocked because they act yeah. as the gatekeepers. No, because the bankers yeah. all will ask, creditor bankers, will ask for a standby with the IMF before rescheduling the debt. Yes, a guarantee. And th that's the London a Club for and the Paris Club. Is, is, is this would, the central role of the IMF today? Yeah, the, and get, it has the been gatekeeper of yeah, the international lending. It has been for, so, for many yeah. years. Except that its ability to act as the gatekeeper has been weakened because, because the, the flow of capital, historically, it policed a f the flow of capital from the rich core of the world to the, to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. The problem is that the flows of capital have changed. But I want to turn attention to the countries that have defied the IMF, you know, because th right now we have the example of Egypt. And I think the, re the refusal to accept the IMF loan is incredibly courageous. I think it reflects the nature of the revolution, and I hope that we can all support the Egyptians in this. So you think it's this. correct? It's not correct. It's, it's going to be hard for it's them hard. because the, the oh. IMF and the creditors will Reprisals, punish them. Yes. They will punish them. I was, I was but on the other hand, they maintain their policy autonomy. Now, the very interesting example is Iceland. Iceland went through this, and then her president, who is a Democrat, had the courage to call for a referendum. Yeah, yeah. He asked the people, and the people said, why should we pay for the private creditors' big mistakes and for the British government's failure to regulate its own banks? We're not doing that. So then they have Im uh, instituted a new regulation, laws, uh, changes to their constitution, which say we will pay our foreign creditors when we have a surplus. But when in years we don't have a surplus, they won't get the money. So that stops the creditors from milking these countries. This is correct. This is correct, but this, this, this was with the approval of the IMF. They got, they got exactly one. Yeah, because one in billion Iceland, foreign. the IMF was so disgraced. How much, how much did they get? One, one billion, uh, $1.4 billion, and they disbursed it. So they took the money and, uh, and, and they did they the, the right thing. I, I agree with you. Iceland is a beautiful example yes, because it's an example of a small country yes. that exercised leverage against a powerful creditor. And as you say, they got the money too, and but on their terms. And let's no, move to the south. Why did Egypt refuse the money, uh, uh, George? Well, because Egypt has bad records of, uh, of going into too much indebtedness, 
and and this is one of the reasons why Egypt probably went to the first Gulf War with the U.S. to liberate Kuwait, because then uh, almost 40 percent of its foreign debt was relieved, mm -hmm. totally wiped out by the Western creditors. But Egypt had bad bad memories of IMF programs yes. of people in the street because uh, you but you've Egypt taken out subsidies to essential products and things like this. Do you, do you agree with the conventional wisdom that um, there were no strings attached no, no, to no, this no, last no, 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 latest no. offer? No, no, no. That that's not true. That's mm. simply not true. No strings attached to so-called bilateral aids mm. from uh, European governments to Egypt. And this also is not true, uh, because I've been an evaluator of uh, European aid. Uh, to disburse aid, you always have a lot of conditionality. That's yeah, yeah. to say there is no strings at that. So, so Alex, if, if this is such a useful tool, certainly geopolitical tool for the United States and the West, why would they ever give it up or give up its leadership? Well, I think they, they will be forced to make adjustments when it comes to the leadership. I don't think, um, I mean, maybe Madame Lagarde is, is going to be f forced to resign for somewhat different reasons. Yeah, and in, in that case... What the, you, mean, uh, you mean the legal process in France? In yeah, France. and in that case, I'm sure that the Europeans will, will try desperately to get another European in charge. But over a longer period of time, they're going to have to give up the yeah. managing directorship. But I think that... What about the, the share in the, in the board? Yeah, I'm sure that they'll have to make adjustments. You think America will ever give up its veto? Uh, not, if, not if it can no. possibly avoid it. But America is, is in an increasingly embattled position because, because of the, the, the scale of the crisis that it now faces, faces itself. So it's a, it's, you know, it may be forced to make concessions that it would, would prefer not to. And we're in that crisis takes us back to the policies of the IMF. Mm -hmm. You know, these policies are parasitic on the real, healthy, productive economy. This is the finance sector, if you like, being acting as parasite on the real economy where we make things and we grow things and we, you know, we are productive. Now, what has happened is that, if you like, <laughs> these bloodsuckers, blood let's be very brutal about this, have starved the body of the real economy. This is hurting now. It's beginning to hurt the United States. It's hurting the Europe. Are you talking in general so about the, the financial markets? Or yes. are you talking, no, about talking about the IMF? I'm like talking about the policies that underpin the IMF. They effectively, because they act for creditors, they are effectively... Talk, 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 talk to us about Africa, since you've known about, about this. Ha have the African economies got much worse with the IMF, or they got better? Are there exceptions to the rule? Well, I mean, I worked with the Nigerians who were, uh, you know, they were very interesting because when, you know the story, if I owe the bank a thousand pounds, it's my problem. If I owe them a million pounds, it's their problem. Nigeria's debt was the IMF's and the bank's problem. And so therefore, um, Ngozi Nkonjo-Wala, Mrs. Nkonjo-Wala, who was their finance minister at the time, had a very strong leverage and very strong influence over the program and so on. And, and in that sense, and achieved $18 billion of debt cancellation. But other countries in Africa that had less lav leverage, uh, you know, did not, did not do as well. I don't want to regionalize the discussion, but I also would like to hear your perspective about IMF in Latin America. But go ahead. Yes. Argentina had an inflation of about 5,000 percent when when the dollar was pegged, the peso was pegged to the dollar. And during four or five years, the program worked very well. Not the IMF program, the program of stabilization. It was later on when the, the country started taking excessive debt and has huge deficits. That was totally inconsistent with this peg. And there is where all these problems with the you, see, you, you also said the same thing about uh, the same thing about Greece, uh, Mario. As you say, in the beginning it worked, but then it didn't. But isn't that the whole point that the long term it works? Yes, but the, no, no. I just was saying that at the beginning has nothing to do with the IMF. I remember mm -hmm. that it's so many people came in to me. Mm -hmm. Sometime academic authority, Mr. Minister in Lebanon, do like Argentina. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, but that was yeah. the uh, uh, <laughs> they were the the poster child. And as I was saying, saying, no, no please, that, no, that, that's no. That's what I'm trying to say. There were two <laughs> periods here, and the first period didn't work. The second period didn't work because uh, obviously was badly managed, and that was supported by the IMF. You know, there's so many episodes in which the role of the IMF 
and the kind of thinking it represents were, it was were negative. It was largely, it was largely political. Uh, of course, the United States wanted to support this particular program. But the, the issue is that uh, Argentina, w after, after this uh, system was uh, abolished, uh, defaulted on its own and uh, pay back to the IMF and actually has no more program. And in, in fact, if you look at the list of programs, there are very few in Latin America. Latin America kind yes, of graduated. It's actually now independent of the com IMF. completely out of. My point is that you cannot claim that the problems in the world come from the IMF. No, of course not. I course am not. saying that they, do, they are pretty, no, pretty it's confused. It's, pretty co it's, it's an very important part of it's the complex It's quite inefficient interest. to resolve yes. problems. That's the IMF here is only implementing the main trend economic thought that you're looking at markets. Are markets free or not? Whether behind the freedom of markets you have a financial oligarchy, you have rent situation, your productive economy is, is, is totally collapsing. The fund and the World Bank and the uh, EU doesn't care. But that's they don't give a damn. As long as you liberalize your economy. But that's yeah, yeah. that's and not just an intellectual error. That's an error that s supports a certain interests. For example, uh, of course. Of well, the banks. Well, it you doesn't know, exclude. I mean, look at the course. incredible record of, of Goldman course. Sachs in of helping course. to set up, for example, the, the crisis in Greece and so, yes. so on and so forth. So there's a confluence between a certain, a certain view of markets and so on and so forth and very yes, powerful but I would blame you know, you know. academics economy. I wouldn't blame a businessman yes. who wants to make, maximize his make profit. Well, morally, it's questionable, the of course. You have to, to also be balanced on that. I, if you, you want to know what the staff of the fund thought about uh, the Greek program, you saw that was a very bad program and it had to include a default a big default. That was the staff, I believe. The, the board and the politicians that uh, actually rule yes, the fund. I think it's the board that makes the decisions. And the board tries to stay invisible. So the board doesn't go fly to Greece. And it's very political. And it's incredibly, it's the United States, it's the big G8 countries. They don't turn up in Athens mm. to deliver the nasty program. Okay. The staff do. And then we aim our anger at the staff, and it's, it's kind of futile to do that, really. However good the intentions of IMF staff are, what we're seeing in Europe at the minute is the restructuring of the economies under, under the supervision of three institutions that aren't really democratically accountable. The European Commission, which has some relationship with elected politicians. It's the least democratic of the three. The European Central Bank, which is designed to be un un unaccountable, and the IMF. And so we have this situation where now, for example, the privatization of public industry in, in Greece is going to be supervised by these external, external forces. Now, in a certain way, you can say, it, <laughs> what's happened to many countries in the third world is now coming home to Europe. And one of the things that's happen happened during the present crisis is because the response of the political elites has been so poor, particularly recently, increasingly it's the, it's the technical elites who are, are shape yeah. shaping the process. Let's, let, let's take this few steps the forward. Lead. What is the alternative to that? Well, the alter one thing would be to go back to the original discussions at Bretton Woods yeah, when, yeah. Uh, when um, <coughs> uh, Keynes proposed an international credit union in which creditors and debtors would be treated e in the, in the sa same way. And the U.S. Yeah, refused yeah. to have that yes. and insisted on a setup in which there was an as asymmetry between creditors and debtors, yeah. because in those days the U.S. was the world's biggest creditor. Right. Now, now we come to an interesting situation because, of course, the U.S. is now the world's biggest debtor. So the U.S. might be supportive of that. Well, if it if it's c control over the dollars, the main reserve currency seriously became compromised, then the U.S. would have to think about other other solutions. The interesting question is, of course, whether the new Great creditor powers like China and, and Germany well, would, would be would like the the kind the, of arrangement. Do you proposed. think the end of double standards could happen within an IMF reform, or it has to be done in an alternative institution? Both. I think that you, there doesn't have to be an alternative institution. You can change the, the structure of this existing institution, but the, you have, you have a big serious problem of governance at this moment, and the problem of governance is very difficult to resolve. It's a political it's a political problem, but. The, more than bad policies or, or more than, uh, I would say, damaging policies, it's a big confusion of policies in, at this moment in the IMF. I think that's because we're going through a transformation it now. It is possible, that we but... Have now, the neoliberal project is being exposed 
you know, for for the weakness and the flawed are you nature saying, of it. Are you, are, and, you say, are, are you saying we've seen the back of the Washington consensus? Uh, I think we're New being, liberal I'm policies not, and I so think on. Yeah. What we're seeing is the dying uh, fight, if you like, struggle of those who want to hold on. Now, I think we're at a point in history where this struggle is is now becoming titanic. Uh, and very unpleasant and, and very difficult. And it's a question of which way the, the world's democracies, societies are going to go. And I fear that people are going to want <coughs> very soon to have some real leadership, to have a strong man yeah. to come and rescue them. And very soon we're going to have fascists raising their again, ugly heads yeah. again. Also, I mean, globalization, the way it works, has to be reformed. Take the depths. I mean, there would be no debt crisis if the debts were kept local. Yes. In domestic currencies, subscribed mostly by domestic investors. Exactly. It is the fact that debt of any country, smallest yeah, one, a big one, is so international. Remember, 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 I, 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 I disagree with that because remember uh, that today, today we are having the Italian crisis. And most of the Italian debt is, uh, is held in domestic currency by local uh, by local uh, no, uh, no, citizens. No, no, it's held in euros. Euros is domestic and currency. No, for it's I not I a domestic well, currency. It's, a, a, it's a one size well, fits all European this currency. Is, folks, this, this is, is a discussion this is for problem. another day. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, gentlemen, and <laughs> wonderful having you here. And I'll be back with the last thoughts. <laughs> Standard & Poor's, Moody, Fitch, names you've hardly heard of before the financial crisis are the private companies that have been rating countries, economies, bonds, and debts. They downgraded countries from Japan to Greece, demoting Portugal, and this month downgraded the US from triple to double A plus. Who are these companies? Who are they accountable to? And if they're in the business of measuring risks and averting crises, why are we always being surprised? And aren't these the same companies whose triple A ratings got us in the financial mess in the first place, promoting the likes of defunct Enron and boosting the subprime mortgage market. More importantly, why aren't they legally liable when they get it so wrong and destroy the livelihoods of millions of working families across the globe? They should be. I say someone needs to rate the raters and monitor the monitors, the International Monetary Fund included. That's the way it goes. Write to me with your thoughts. Until next time.